in 17th century and 18th century, the European travelers uh, traveling to India, they noticed a striking similarity between Sanskrit on one hand and some European languages on the other. In uh, 1790, William, Sir William Jones was the founder of uh, Asiatic Society of Calcutta, also a philologist, and decided that uh, these being similar, they form a part of Indo-European language. Early 1800s, Rig Veda was translated into English, where the Arya of Rig Veda was translated into Aryan. A couple of decades later, James Pritchard in uh, 1843, I think, uh, said that if there is an Indo-European language, there must be a race speaking this language. So he said this race was Aryan race who spoke Indo-European language. And he positioned the Aryans in Central Asia. Before I talk about the book, yes, I will speak about uh, Professor B.B. Lal. Quite a few of uh, you may or may not have heard of him or met him or know about him. Professor Lal was born in 1921. He did his master's in Sanskrit in Allahabad University. Around that time, the government felt that the Archaeological Survey of India needed a fresh blood. So they then, Director General uh, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, went around universities to select people. And he picked up uh, uh, the young Brajibasi from Malabad University. Professor Lal then went and did his training at Takshala with Sir Mortimer and joined the Archaeological Survey of India in 1946 as assistant superintendent. Immediately afterwards, uh, Mortimer called him for excavations at Harappa. So that was also in 1946. He continued in the survey till he became its director general at the young age of 47 in 1968, where he served for four years and then sought voluntary retirement to pursue research and excavations. His excavations included uh, Harappa to begin with, uh, Shishupal Garden 1948. He excavated sites connected with the Mahabharat, Hastinapur and Indraprast in Pranakala, and explored Kurukshetra, Kampilya, and Matra. Thereafter was uh, a delegation that he led to United to Egypt at the request of UNESCO. And this was in 1961, and it was to Nubia in Egypt. In 1961, upon returning, he excavated the site of Kalibanga, which you are aware is the uh, Indus Saraswati civilization city. Upon retiring, his next excavation was uh, the sites connected with the Ramayana, in which he excavated Ayodhya. Bhadwad Ashram, Nandi Gram, Shringvirpur. And uh, you perhaps may know that when at Ayodhya he discovered the uh, Ram Temple pillars, and uh, that was how this Ram Temple, Brahm Patishtha, is on 22nd. Almost 50 years after he discovered the whole thing, and I'm humbled to say that I've been invited to represent him there. Amongst his books, uh, his seminal papers are around 150 in number, and they've been uh, published in UK, USA, Japan, Russia, and three or four more other countries, Egypt included. And he has written 16 books. I think the most uh, favorite of his books were the Rigvedic people, uh, invaders, immigrants, or uh, indigenous. Other one was uh, historicity of uh, Mahabharat. Yet another one was Ram Temple 
Mandir and Setu. And uh, the Hindi version of uh, Rigvedic people, invaders, ever immigrants and uh, indigenous is this. Aryoka Adidesh Bharat. He is referred to he has addressed this book specifically for the Hindi-speaking belt, and hence in Hindi. His awards included uh, two dilets from St. Petersburg, another one was from uh, Deccan College, Vidya Varad, uh, title, title of uh, Maha Mahopadhyay, from the Prime Minister of India, then Lifetime Achievement Award in Archaeology, to uh, uh, felicitation volumes, one by Sri Krishnakant in 1997, other one by Sri Venkaya and I do in uh, 2019, and Padma Bhushan in uh, year 2000, and Padma Bhushan in 2021. <clears throat> now, a bit about Aryok Adidesh Bharat. He started this book when he was 99 years old. He finished it when he was 100 and gave it to publish, uh, for publishing. It was to be released in September 2022, but he passed away 10 days before the release. So we, you know, everything had to be sort of postponed, kept postponing indefinitely after that. I would like to mention about the Aryan of the Aryan invasion of India fame. And the Arya that Professor Lal is talking about. Way back in 17th century and 18th century, the European travelers uh, traveling to India, they noticed a striking similarity between Sanskrit on one hand and some European languages on the other, these being Celtic, Gothic, Persian, Greek, and Latin. They felt that the vocabulary, they realized that the vocabulary and grammar of these languages was the same and was based on Sanskrit. In uh, 1790, William, Sir William Jones was the founder of uh, Asiatic Society of Calcutta, also a philologist, and decided that uh, these being similar, they form a part of Indo-European language thus hijacking Sanskrit from India to a set of Indo-European language. Early 1800s, Rig Veda was translated into English, where the Arya of Rig Veda was translated into Aryan. A couple of decades later, James Pritchard in uh, 1843, I think, uh, said that if there is an Indo-European language, there must be a race speaking this language. So he said this race was Aryan race who spoke Indo-European language. And he positioned the Aryans in Central Asia. To those west of Central Asia, he called them Indo, uh, he called them European Aryans into those placed in east of uh, Central Asia, as in India, he called them Indo-Aryans. Thus this Aryan became a uh, regular uh, term during those days. In the uh, 1880s, Max Müller declared that, you know, the Aryans walked into this country in 1500 BCE and wrote Rig Veda in 1200 BCE. So when he was challenged as how to how you come, how have you arrived at these dates, he didn't have an answer. Really, and he finally gave up saying, okay, it could have been anywhere. Nobody, no power on earth, he said, will ever be able to determine when Rig Veda was written. And then in 1946, Sir Mortimer Wheeler excavating Harappa saw a fortification wall that was destroyed, and he declared this is the result of the Aryan invasion of India. And that's how the story was built up about Aryans and Aryan invasion of India. On the other hand, Arya, that the book is about, are the Aryas and Dasyus of the Rigvedic people. So this is the Arya that Professor Lal has written about and the book that is there. 
Now about the book itself, as I mentioned, he had written a book, Aryan, the, the Rigvedic people, invaders, immigrants, or indigenous. This book is about a part of that book, whole book. But as I said, it was intended for those people who are Hindi speaking bed, and hence it is in Hindi. The chapter one describes the Indo European uh, language and the people talking about it, the ones that I've already spoken to you about. Chapter two talks about uh, the congruency of Rigvedic people and the Harappan civilization. I'll tell you how it is. Like, if you, if you recall, the Harappan civilization on the east was spread to Ganga Yamuna Dwab and continued west right up to River Indus, its mature period being 2500 BCE. So we can safely say that uh, the Harappan civilization was in the third millennium and spread between Ganga on the east and Indus on the west. Now, when Professor Lal was excavating Kalibanga, in which he found it was a pre Harappan and Major Harappan setup, he wanted to find out how this civilization decayed. And he got a set of a group of uh, geologists and hydrologists led by an Italian uh, Robert Rakes to dig Bowell to dig wells into the, in the Ghagar, as you're aware, Ghagar is the new name or the recent modern name for the old Saraswati. And the team found out that this Saraswati dried, dried up in 2000 BCE. If you're aware, the Rig Ved has mentioned a mighty flowing river called Saraswati, starting from Himalayan glacier right down to the ocean. And this mighty river mentioned 75 times, but decayed in 2000. It, very safely to say that it was a mighty flowing river, so to speak, around middle of 3rd millennium BC. What does Rig Ved say about its people? Allow me to read this uh, Rigvedic Mandal 10, Sukh 75. Uh, verses 5 and 6, which describe the spread of Rigvedic people. O Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Shutudri, which is Satlaj, and Parushni, Rabi, they're going into from east to west, Rabi, Chenab, and Jhelam. It says the Ras and the Shwed, that is Swat, and thereafter Kuba, sorry, uh, Parushni, Madhuvrita, and Asikani, which is Chenab, and Vitasta, Jhelam, and Sushumna, Sohan. Please listen to and accept this hymn of mine. O Sindhu, flowing, and then the hymn talks about the various tributaries of the river Indus, and then he says, finally, you move on to the same chariot as them. So here again, if you notice, they are talking about Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Shutudri, right onto Sindhu, that is Indus. And this Rigvedic people of 3rd millennium BC is proved, and the Harappan civilization also of 3rd millennium BC, the east and the southern east and the extreme west are absolutely congruent. The time is congruent, and which, therefore, which culture was in uh, Rigvedic people was the Harappan culture, and therefore he comes to a conclusion. Uh, that the Rig Vedic people were the inhabitants of uh, the Harappan civilization. I mean, uh, it's, it's so geographically it matches and in timelines it matches. So that was his uh, book on Rig Vedic people. The same is mentioned in chapter two over here. Chapter three talks about the holiness of the Aryan invasion theory, which he again uh, dismisses it. Uh, in this chapter. Now, chapter four. If you recall, the Aryan invasion theory was finally given up by a certain scholars, a certain section of scholars, and uh, somewhere around middle of 80s, 
Romala Thapa said, okay, fine, we agree. If there's no invasion, then it must have been immigration. And this was immediately followed by Sri Arash Sharma saying that this, the migration of Aryan people came from BMAC. Now, if you have a look at uh, the BMAC, which is Bacteria Margiana Archaeological Complex, you'll find it is so advanced culturally that it could not be a civilization of pastoral cattle breeders, as they mentioned. And you, how can it, a you know, set of pastoral cattle breeder in immigrants can teach Rig Veda to a set of people covering one and a half million square kilometers. So this immigration theory also went for a bunt after Professor Lal discussed the BMAC and its culture. And BMAC is post-Harappan, post-Rigvedic. On the chapter, on the next chapter is uh, Professor Ozell's statements on Rigvedic flora and fauna as it came from a cold climate. And Professor Lal has proved that they, none of these uh, were from cold climate and they were from temperate climate and he discusses each tree and each animal that has been discussed by Professor Pozel. Okay, the next chapter is uh, on Aryans going west. You remember there's AIT, that Aryan vision theory, and then they came OIT, out of India theory. The uh, OIT is actually mentioned in Baudhayan Shot Sutra which uh, in its text 18.44 says that the sons of Ayla, Pururvas, and Urvashi named Ayu and Amavasu migrated respectively to east and west. And Ayu migrated eastwards. Now notice the places that they migrated. Kuru, Panchal, Gurkshet area, present-day Haryana, Panchal, and Kashi and Vidya, that's Varanasi was east UP. The uh, people who moved westwards were Gandhari, Parasu, and Aratta, which is Kandahar, Persia, and Turkey. So if they were to move from here, where were they located? Weren't they located between Gandhar and uh, Kurukshetra, where again puts you in a slot where the Rigvedic people were. Clearly indicated the Rigvedic people were the ones who moved outside and nobody came from outside to India. So that, and chapter seven is about the continuity of Saraswati civilization. For the last 5,000 years, you have seen Sindhur, it was there. You have seen Swastik, it was there in civilization. You have seen yoga, the terracottas have been uh, found over there. So that is a brief resume, a brief, uh, description of the chapters that has been mentioned. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Lal, Sanjeev, and uh, my friend Swapan, uh, Honorable Principal, and everybody else here. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm running a bit of cold, so my eyes are a little watery and throat is a bit sore, but irrespective of that, I still am in high spirits and good health. So this book uh, is something which is um, so exciting and uh, from very social perspective. I feel Indians are normally spoken as people who never wrote their history. Whereas I believe we did remember our history and the written records may have got destroyed for many use of organic material, which is very easily destroyable. Second, so many invasions which would have destroyed the history any one way. But this book becomes important because the second line of the punch, uh, pram, we, are, we are taking five points in our oath. And the, one of them is Gulami ki mansikta ko jad se ukhaar bhekenge. Removing all the signs and symbols of slavery. This book is primarily indicative of that particular aspect where the Indian minds, which are pretty bright minds, uh, but have been enslaved over a period of few centuries. And that enslavement happens that we argue against our own case. 
And if somebody comes and tells us that, look, Aryan invasion to Aryan migration is fakery, it's, it's all false, we'll question that person rather than find supporting evidence which proves our point of view. And the biggest fact is that the point of view, of course, Dr. B.B. Lal, Brijbasi, as the name suggests, the name is Brijbasi. So the area around Bridge, which is Gangetic Plain, right center, and I was reading the map, and the map is very interesting for people like me because I traced my roots to Harappa. Um, again, not because it's a concocted story, but because 1947, my family migrated from Harappa to this part of the country. And all our ancestors, when we look at the rituals and things, I was very happy when Dr. Uh, when Mr. Lal was explaining that Kuru Panchar Kshetra. So we have some traditions in the family. One, of course, all the mortal remains post uh, you've cremated the dead, go to Haridwar. And in Haridwar, the, the pandas maintain a record. So we have a record. The part we, from which we come from, all that is recorded as part of personal history and cannot be documented any other way except going to that very pandit through who, to whom your family ancestors have been going to. Second, there is a process in which if there is an unnatural death of someone due to ailment or accident or any such thing, we go to Kurukshetra, Eva is the place where we all go and we perform part of the last rites there also. There also it's all documented. And this is the area in which the Mahabharat seemed to have taken place. If uh, the story of uh, Mahabharat or Ramayan, which is orally taught to all of us. And that's why I say we are great storytellers. And Indians are huge storytellers. Every family has their personal stories to the stories uh, which are your religious stories. And I hate the word, mytho thank you very much, mythology, because mythology is, uh, you know, if you, Many, many times I've noticed, and this is especially for the youngsters, many times people in vain use the word called mythology. And if you study the meaning of mythology, mythology is study of myth. Now, if I'm going to call my religious beliefs as myth, then I can question what is Quran and what is Bible. All myth. Why is that not mythology and why is all Hindu religion books are mythologies. So I think this is something which all of you should question in your mind, that either everything is a myth, everything falls under mythology, but some fall under religious studies, others fall under mythology, which is what we should refrain from using the word mythology. And I know many people who use this word. And this is one word which I hate the most because I feel study of religions can be one way. The fact is that proving what is written to the physical evidence, which needs to be, of course, brought into the knowledge, this book has a very interesting map. And that map is indicative of the spread of the civilizational remains. Now, obviously, after the India of the erstwhile got partitioned just about 75 years ago, a whole lot of evidence on the other side has been lost, which was primarily the places which were directly connecting us to Central Asia and also to West Asia and Persia, because uh, through Afghan present-day Afghanistan, erstwhile uh, Gandhar, was connecting to, through Herat, connecting us to Persia, and Persians are nothing but Aryans themselves. So there are some tablets, like there is a tablet of Darius, which is found in Persia, and that which they call ancient Persian. If you, if you read the script, the script is different. But if you read the, the spoken language is Sanskrit. So it says, Aryan putra so-and-so, so-and-so, father was so-and-so. 
So 10 such generations using the word Arya Putra and Arya himself. So Arya is nothing but the, the king or, or the head of the uh, herd. And then his generation, his family history is found. The present book by B, Dr. B.B. Lal becomes very, very relevant in, in decolonizing our minds. Because uh, saying Harappan people were different and Vedic people were different and they all came from outside the country becomes so irrelevant because the expanse of the civilization is nothing but Indus Saraswati civilization. And that Indus Saraswati civilization uses the same coinage. So it was advanced enough to use the coins. I mean, I know a whole lot of you are the students of commerce and you understand the trade. So trade and commerce was something which was connecting this whole region and the coinage was identical. So coinage being identical, people also have to be identical. And the best thing, of course, Dr. B.B. Lal would have written it when he would have written and his works are different in terms of the genetic evidence which is found today. I just thank uh, Mr. Rajiv Lal for bringing out this book, uh, though it's his father's book. But in addition to this, the genetic evidence today, there's a, there's, there's a uh, mutation which has happened amongst all of us. And A1C mutation, is what you track genetically. So the A1 part of it, most of the men uh, in India possess that A1, which is ancient mutation as compared to A1C mutation, which is found in Europe, which only goes to prove that the migration happened out of this landmass to West Asia, Central Asia, and through Central Asia in couple of hundred years, it went to Europe. So, in fact, I was reading, there's a very interesting line uh, which says, and, and it's by a European actually, where this person is mocking. Uh, it says, European vidwano mein ye hod itni zabardas thi ki us desh ke har ek bhaag ke dawe lagaye gaye. Is par vyang karte ve Jean Paul de Mol 1918 said, that they came from north. Yadi Rusi hai, to vah Purav mein batayega, that they came from the east. Or yadi Italian ya Spaniard hai, to vah Madde mein batayega. Matlab, unhi ko nahi pata, east, west, north, south, kidar se aaye The fact is, the migration happened via Central Asia, to Europe, and the traces are found in the form of coinage, uh, Vishnu Murti. And I was once planning to do some project, which uh, I mean, bureaucracy and uh, things have their own take. But I wanted to do a project on Volga and Ganges, or because we don't have that many traces of Saraswati. Ideally, it should have been Saraswati, but because of lack of those traces, I thought maybe Ganges is not a bad idea, because whatever excavations in and around these regions have happened, you find a lot of Vaishnav, Vaishnavite uh, signatures all over. And you find coinage which is common. So maybe a comparative study would bring in more facts. Genetic study combined with this archaeological study will bring in certain more facts. And I wanted to establish a, a center which is uh, Indus Saraswati Center. Uh, so that people stop calling uh, this as Indus Valley Civilization because the expanse is far beyond the Indus Delta. The expanse is Indo-Gangetic region. And I am not a geologist, but we have to track in which other forms Saraswati got to exist itself. And some scientific data on that will help us understand that aspect that while a wall came uh, in in front of in between Saraswati and Saraswati disappeared, and because Saraswati disappeared, people started migrating because they had no place for sustenance, and they migrated far and wide. 
but where did the water disappear the water will always as we say you know in english water will find its level so the water which was massive and huge in saraswati where has that water disappeared we say that there are subterranean uh, flow of the river uh, but the volume of the river as it described in rigveda was huge so i'm sure the the river may exist in some other form in the name of other tributaries or others but a different kind of study with evidence needs to be collected and done but what i love the most about this book is that it establishes the ancient ancestry of indians in india so it's not as if why we welcome people from all over we are not the originals i say we are the originals and i always say i'm the original aryan because i come from harappa directly and not far far back but 1947 and uh, our land and property and everything comes from that region and i joke about it but the but the the serious side is that the history of india was denied the historicity to india was denied and as luck will have it this morning i was reading about hemu and i was just sort of it i was questioning my mind that with jogi did hemu live in or with jogi did uh, prithviraj chauhan lived in because these are the guys who ruled delhi and their ancestors who ruled ruled delhi so delhi is been made into a medieval city uh starting with uh, uh, invasions and uh, muslims who took over the city from mughal period and all uh and we track red fort to shahaja but there are traces and tracks which go beyond shahaja's reign because they were ruling out of agra and not delhi they came to delhi subsequently so while they were ruling from agra who was ruling delhi and if this is the seat of indraprast as dr lal has established that the ancient city of indraprast was where old fort is and we conducted some excavations there again i had a mind that like in greece athens they have a open uh, not really open air but like this hole uh, on the sides they have they have exposed certain parts preserved that by the walls and put the glass on top so you see the civilizational remains underneath and it's a walk in kind of a, a museum so i had i i wanted to do that in purana kila so that people know that purana kila was always habited always so you find traces of gray ware pottery you find uh, ochre colored pottery you find subsequent structures you find rajput structures and rajput period is before i mean it's 7th 8th century uh, ad and then you also find uh, structures and remains from mauryan empire so and and including 1947 which becomes so relevant for us when people migrated or or were forced migrated to this part of the country from erstwhile india then the camps were established in purana kila so some traces of purana chakki from 1947 glasses etc you can find that as well so this region was always habited and i'm sure if you extend this region little further the entire area of humayun's tomb and the side if we put the trenches i'm i'm 120% sure you will find rest of the history including if you put trenches on this side towards red fort you will find different history probably some trenches had been put in the past but they had been closed down for various other reasons but by coming back to the book by dr b b lal it becomes relevant because way back in late 60s to 70s when he was the dg asi he did some remarkable work he put trenches in this region he tracked the veracity of mahabharat and ramayan of course taking away certain facts or or taking away certain stories around original facts but the the historicity of things taking place and indraprastha was this region 
including Hastinapur, which is what we call present in Meerut and beyond, which is even today called Hastinapur. Ayodhya ji, of course, he was the one who tracked Ayodhya ji at that time and which led to subsequent excavations by K.K. Mohammed and several others in the capacity of DGs of ASI. And they remained true to their kernel by bringing out the evidence which was all uh, there. But again, colonization of mines happened, so people lived in deniability and people did not want history to come out the way history exists. I just pray that this book, uh, in fact, one very interesting part is right in the beginning. One is a map, which is so, so lovely. I mean, it's a beautiful map because it describes exactly the Indus, Indus, Indus Saraswati Valley and the region in which this civilization existed. Um, alongside this, there is a mention uh, which says that Bangza is an area in Turkey. And in that area, some tablets, clay tablets have been found. This book is not mentioning, but read somewhere else. Hitani and Mitani people have entered into a treaty. And the witnesses to that treaty are Varun and Indra. Isn't that interesting? I mean, Varun and Indra can't be tracked to someone else other than us because we continue to use these words even till date. So even origin of Sanskrit, and there's a, there's a huge thing about usurpation of knowledge. And that's what has happened with us. We continue to be very open-minded and open society where anyone can just walk in, we'll show where our literature is, we'll be happy to share all the information that we possess, sometimes show off how knowledgeable we are. But in the end, we are the ones who are giving out our knowledge to others who will rephrase the same thing without acknowledging that it all came from India. And that usurpation of Indian knowledge is what has happened. And in modern times, I laugh about it. But on a serious note, the, the Haldi ka dood, which we all get to drink because of our dadis and nannies and moms, becomes golden latte. And that's what has happened with all our civilizational values and systems. But this is an example just appropriate enough to bring back the fact that on daily basis, our knowledge gets usurped by others, comes back to us in different forms and shapes, and we pay for it. The worst is we pay for it. So this book will establish that Amrit Kal Ka Bharat will be what, and how this Amritkal generation will get inspired by reading this book and take the ethical and civilizational values of ancient India to modern times so that 2047 India is truly decolonized India, is truly a developed India, is truly a self-reliant India. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. And rather, they'd become a conversation, uh, which would be much more interesting, I would think. Um, so first of all, let me congratulate you for bringing out this uh, book of your fathers, who, um, as you know, and many of you here will also know, is by some margin the uh, greatest archaeologist of post-independence India. And he did some amazing things, some of which you heard about. Uh, but it is as, uh, it's quite extraordinary that he had the enthusiasm to keep writing and arguing and looking at new evidence uh, all the way to the age of 100. And, um, you know, he, 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 when he started his career, um, racist theories of various kinds were commonplace. Uh, this was back in the 30s and 40s. And so the idea that India may be the origin of world civilization in some form was actually anathema. Even though, interestingly, in the beginning of the 19th century, 100 years before that, it was actually commonly accepted. But through the course of the 19th century, as the Europeans came to dominate the world, they also came to come up with this idea that they themselves, in some fashion, were a pure race and source of civilization to the world in some fashion. And they, by the way, didn't just do this to us. They had similar theories in the rest of the world as well. For example, when in Zimbabwe they found a big site of a, of a city, um, in, in, uh, they, they came up with something called the hemetic th invasion theory, 
which suggested that people from the north must have come and settled here and set up the city. It couldn't possibly be these dark looking people uh, living there. Uh, whereas we now know from more than adequate evidence that it was actually the local uh, tribes who had built that city. So they did it everywhere. They did it in India as well. Um, and so what is uh, amusing is not so much that the Europeans are having done this colonial project and therefore having uh, appropriated other people's uh, civilization, uh, including the, the symbol of the swastika, uh, for their own uh, imperial purposes. What is extraordinary is that 75 years after became independent, we're having to still establish this fact. But Dr. B.B. Lal, through his career, saw the uh, debate also shift. It went with the Aryan invasion theory, uh, then it became the Aryan migration theory. Uh, then it somehow now has been diluted down to Aryan tourism theory. But uh, I think the fact is that evidence has accumulated over time, which clearly strengthens the arguments he was making. And of course, he was somebody who was actually on the ground digging things up, uh, not just quoting uh, each other's texts, as many historians in India, post-independence India, have done. He was actually looking at primary evidence because he was digging it up. And so that is something that is an important part of what we now need to do, is to go and actually pull out the actual primary evidence. And so after a long break, after his pioneering excavations going back in the 50s and 60s, in the very recent past, we have begun to do new digs. And the findings from that are extraordinary. So not only are we finding out about the Sindhu Saraswati civilization, we in fact are finding that the other parts of India also had other civilizations which had links to the Sindhu Saraswati but were somewhat different. Just east, northeast of here, at Sanoli in the village, we have found uh, remains of two chariots, which are the oldest chariots by the way in the world. There are no older chariots. It, uh, and uh, there are two of them. One of them is rather well preserved. And... Um, the most important interesting fact about the Sanoli chariots is, first of all, it's not in the northwest, it's actually in the Gangetic Plains. It's also, in some ways, should be common sense. I mean, even if the Aryans had chariots in Central Asia, uh, if they were attempting to take them over the Hindu Kush and then through the riverine terrain, loamy soil of Punjab, they would have long abandoned it. I mean, a chariot is not very useful in hilly or... Uh, river, uh, uh, I mean, wet terrain. It is only useful in flat terrain of Haryana and Western UP. So not surprisingly, the Kurukshetra war was fought in Haryana. If you go to the terrain of Kurukshetra, you'll see why it is a useful weapon there. It would simply not be very useful in Afghanistan. So not surprisingly, that the earliest chariots have been found here, going back to about 4,000 years ago. Also interesting is that this culture is actually a eastern culture. I, this is the culture that is there from around Bagpat area, going eastward to about the Allahabad area. This is the culture that had it. We actually have very well-preserved things, including swords, uh, sp spears, uh, shields, uh, and other things that have been preserved from this culture. And it is a very warlike culture, but it is actually from the east, uh, not from the northwest. So if, even if there were, the, even if the Sindhu Saraswati civilization was at having military conflict with somebody, these were probably people more to the east of them, um, which would fit also many of the battles, like the Battle of Ten Kings. We know that the Bharatas fought with a, a battle on the banks of the Yamuna with a, a chieftain called Bheda, whom they defeated. And it also fits the fact that many of the Indus uh, Saraswati sites are well fortified. So clearly, this was a living culture, also a warlike culture, uh, and uh, certainly not somebody who would just get toppled over with ease by a small group of uh, people coming in from the north, uh, from the northwest, from somewhere in Central Asia. So this is a book that is uh, written in Hindi. I like the fact that I think very often uh, new findings, etc., take a long, long time to find their way into Indian languages. And this is an important thing that I think people in the audience, uh, particularly the younger members of the audience, need to take in. You know, people complain about mother tongues and Indian languages, but they'll only remain alive if there's new information that is coming into these languages, not just, you know, uh, translations of old texts. So again, uh, Dr. Lal, in his hundredth year, uh, wrote a book in Hindi 
bringing some of the latest ideas of that uh, uh, that he had found uh, into this book so thank you very much uh, uh, mr lal for publishing this book well sanjeev since you've uh, established the pattern of um, sitting and talking i'll emulate you i think one of a shortcoming of this session was that we didn't have a portrait of bb lal here i think this was it's very important for a generation of people for whom professor bb lal may not feature in their consciousness to actually realize what an important figure he was to our generation and it was an he was an important figure because he stood his ground as a professional archaeologist despite the vilification which was heaped on him and it sometimes you know it we realize it because every conceivable finding of professor lal whether it was the mahabharat excavations in indraprastha or the ayodhya excavations they were questioned including suggestions that he doctored the evidence that he brought things from somewhere else and put it there it was in that sort of environment that he brought his findings were before the public so we owe him a huge debt of gratitude for standing his ground inspiring other professional archaeologists to do what they wanted to do now if you are interested in 2010 the allahabad high court gave a judgment on the ayodhya case one of the judges very painstakingly documented the entire fallacies which were spread in the name of history by so called eminent historians and eminent archaeologists who when questioned freely admitted that they had never been to a dig that they never even they were not even familiar with the language in which some of the inscriptions were written so professor bb lal resisted the temptation to distort archaeology and to use archaeology for a very narrow political end so to that extent he was a very faithful disciple of sir mortimer wheeler mortimer wheeler's conclusions you can today contest and no doubt they should be contested because subsequent findings you know can modify or change what your perceptions are but these were people who were not out to actually show a preconceived notion of what was there after all if you will you really to find out ashoka today has been reintroduced into the consciousness of india only 120 140 years ago before that we'd forgotten about ashoka and it was certain archaeologists and who cunningham and people like that princep who brought about and in fact the archaeological survey of india played a very very important role in this therefore when we have minakshi lekhi with us let me publicly state some of the complaints we have now <laughs> now you're in trouble <laughs> <laughs> first complaint the control over the archaeological survey of india has passed from professional archaeologists to professional bureaucrats that to my mind is one of the biggest distortions which has happened because what has resulted is the a certain skewing of priorities how kk mohammed or someone like professor bibilal or even someone like 
Professor Dilip Chakravarti would have viewed the priorities of an archaeological survey are very different from an IAS officer who's there for two years or three years. And I think this is a very serious issue. It's not really scoring a point here and there. Secondly, I want to bring apart, uh, highlight that most of the priorities of the archaeological survey, unfortunately, has been to maintain certain monuments for a tourist purpose and not enough resources are being given to the digs for excavations and that must change and finally and this is a complaint about education at one time there were departments of archaeology, very vibrant departments of archaeology in certain universities. Most of them, courtesy about 50 years of trying to show that empirical history does not exist, that uh, you know we must have theoretical basis of history, etc. Those departments have been whittled down and we are not getting enough of a new crop of archaeologists, of people who are tutored in the languages of the digs, of, of in ancient India, etc. And also, the fact that archaeology today has developed a certain very profound scientific basis. And the mastery of that is equally important. So, given that we are honoring, we are paying a tribute to Professor Lal, it's also important to bring out what the implications of the works of, P of Professor Lal are for public policy and for the manner in which we as a country will look forward to our future, uh, to our past and, in, and explore the future in that sense. Thank you very much. Let me just quickly respond to one of the accusations and he'll be pleased to hear Shapanda that a new ASI DG has been appointed and he is in fact a professional archaeologist. So, <laughs> so step one, step two, resources is not an issue. Uh, let me tell you, uh, the, now that we have somebody who actually knows how to carry out digs, etc. Now the resources will be made available. <laughs> Sanjeev, you become a bureaucrat. Resources are always an issue. There are a finite amount of resources and understandably there are a finite amount of resources. The amount are of resources? you going to... Hmm. I, I would suggest that a lot of the maintenance of monuments, particularly in this Delhi area, which gets a lot of media attention, is actually transferred from the ASI to other bodies which are capable of maintaining it equally well so that the resources of the ASI is not expanded, expended only for the promotion of tourism. The resources are very tiny. We can quadruple the amount of resources and nobody will notice. Being done. Thank you so much to our speakers. Honorable speakers for such a lively conversation and discussion. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Principal Ma'am uh, to give us the vote of thanks and wrap up the session. Thank you. Privilege to be giving a vote of thanks to, for an area which was very well discussed. It gives me immense pride to introduce this kind of multidisciplinary approach which we are doing because of the Literature Festival. Some of the books, including Mr. Lal's book, there are not just historical issues of Aryans coming as invaders or migrators or as tourists, which is being spoken about. There is so much more even in terms of the culture at that point in time. I mentioned about the ethics. There is economics embedded. There is finance embedded. There is governance embedded. There would also be aspects related to sustainability and how to address climate changes in it. So if we are able to get all this documented by whatever is coming in these books, 
even from the perspective of economics and commerce, reading history has become so very important. And once again, sincere thanks to Sanjeev ji and Mr. Das Gupta for giving us this opportunity to host. And I also must say Sanjeev ji is a very dear alumnus. We often go to him, reach out to him whenever we are in need of anything. Thank you so much for being passionate about your own very college. Thank you all of you once again.